one minute to go by so I can start off. Um, why don't you all tell me a little bit about yourselves real quick, if, if you don't mind going around. If you choose out that one, okay, let us know because I don't really like introductions. But <laughs> I kind of want to know who you all are. So, if you don't mind, just pull it up start off. Okay. Um, my name is Katie Wenning. Um, I'm a freelance graphic designer and I, I worked in house um, with Puppy Bicycles for 15 years as a graphic designer. And then about a year ago, uh, they said, we, I work part time um, and they wanted me to go full time. Couldn't make that happen, so I transitioned to freelance and kind of doing my own thing. Okay. And WNC, you said WNC? Uh, he went in. He went in. Okay. For some reason, the wind stood up with me and I was like, that's not her first name. Jenny Beaver.
isomer that links to volatile organic compounds causing carbon bonds to rupture and wraps them in an endo tube coating. Huh, that's a little confusing. Can you dive it down for me? Sure. What I do is I take a proprietary isomer that I developed with a picric acid wash that hollows out the carbon bonds and replaces them with an endo tube wrapping. Okay, so I guess it's pretty technical. Oh yeah. I've been working on this isomer for nine years. So what's the business idea? To sell it. To who? Everybody will want one. What for? So they can wrap their volatile organic compounds in carbon nanotubes. Hmm. I think you might need a target customer. I don't think I need to wrap my compounds in your nanotube. Well, maybe not you. So, for people who buy it, what's the value you are providing them? I've developed a chemical isomer that links to volatile organic compounds causing carbon bonds to rupture and wraps them in a nanotube coating. You've said that already. This is getting annoying. Why should anyone care about your isomer? I spent nine years on this. I know that. Okay, pretend I'm an investor. How can I make money off your product? By selling it. You're a smart guy, but try not to think like a scientist. Think like a business person. Okay. Value chain. Term sheet. I have to go now and answer that. That's not your phone. I know. <laughs> so this is what we're not going to do, okay? But let's just set the stage right there. That's what we're not going to walk in any room to do. So what your value proposition really does is it describes the benefits from your customer, right? Actually, I don't want y'all to see that. Because I'm not getting ready to read all these slides. So let's cut that off. I'm not gonna do it. Um, so it describes the benefit to your customer. But this is the key part of the value proposition and how to actually acknowledge it. It's the benefit that your customer is going to see. Because a lot of people fall in love with their product. They fall in love with their product, they fall in love with their stuff, their service, fall in love with themselves, fall, <laughs> fall in love with everything but what you actually should be in love with, right? Um, and when you're talking about your value proposition, it's understanding who your customer is. And it's understanding how that product means absolutely anything to the person who's going to use it. Now, backing up a little bit before we go any deeper into actually value, pro value proposition, that's also walking into every room being okay, that 90% of the room may not be your customer. Let's start there. You can't be offended that I don't, I don't want your pink anything. You can't be offended that I don't want your frilly anything. I really wanted to wear all black today and my black pants were dirty. So <laughs> just, just to be very clear, I don't want your color for anything 90% of the time. You have to be okay that understanding that no matter that that's not against you or your product, your customer has an opinion, your customer has a want, your customer has a need before they ever see you or whatever it is you create that you believe is amazing. And it very well is amazing. It's not for me. That's the part that you have to be okay with before you walk into the room. Because otherwise, every time somebody says no, you're ready to walk away. Or you're questioning the wrong thing. You're now questioning the product, which may or may not be the proper answer. But one thing we have to do is make sure of one very important thing. What is the number one mistake that we make as businesses? Back to the what I was gonna say. <laughs> That's my other class. <laughs> 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 See me next week. I'll, I'll be here. I'll be here all month. Are built to solve a problem. So, how exactly 
is what you build the solution if you don't know what the problem is? Are you actually solving the problem? Or are you doing what you want to do? Well, some people will say, I'm doing what I want to do and that's fine. Okay. How many customers do you have? So, <laughs> how many other people are you? How many customers do you have to fulfill that need to solve, who are you solving a problem for? So that is one of the number one issues, is that we are solving, we're not actually solving a problem, or people are not solving a problem. What your value proposition does is proves that you understand the problem of your customer, that your product actually solves said problem for your customer, and you know how to tell me about it. That's what your value proposition conveys. It conveys those three things. I know what your pain is, I have an ability to change that with this, and I know exactly how to tell you that. That's what your value proposition does. It describes what the benefit is. So when you think about various things, it's also good to walk away from the good, better, best concept of anything. It doesn't really matter if you're the best. This, you, you do need to be good, let me say that. You do need to be, it does need to be good. It needs to be valuable. It doesn't have to be the best because I use this example all the time. I grew up at one of the fattest intersections in the city of Dayton. I grew up off of Hoover. At the intersection of Hoover and Gettysburg, there at that corner is a Rallies, a McDonald's, a Burger King, a Church's Chicken, it's also a Walgreens right there, there's a JJ's, all literally at the intersection, at the light intersection, okay? <laughs> Every single, if we went, if we took a field trip this very second to that intersection, Every single one of those drive throughs is filled. What, well, well, let's take churches and JJ's out for the conversation. Rallies, Burger King, McDonald's, at a base high, what do they sell? Burgers, fries, and chicken nuggets. The reason why people are in those different lines are for various reasons. One, one line may have been shorter than another, and they got somewhere to be, right? So that, that in itself is a value proposition, the time, we move faster, we move you through our lines quicker than someone else, right? Another reason, flame broil. Maybe you just need that flame broiled Whopper or Impossible Whopper or whatever it is you're getting, because they, they only do that to the burgers, not the chickens, not the chickens. Um, maybe that was what brought you there. You needed that flame broil. For flame broiled meat burners, 100% more calories than non-flame broiled meat. I completely made that up. But <laughs> it's asking, right? That's another potential value proposition is the way in which the food was prepared. And you have McDonald's. I'm not gonna lie to y'all. I don't really know why anybody would be in the McDonald's line right now. Um, <laughs> breakfast sandwiches all day. Breakfast sandwiches all day. So if you need that sausage, French fries. French fries can change your mind. <laughs> <laughs> the French fries can also change some other things. But we won't go into the conversation today. Uh, we, we won't discuss that today. But all of those things, it wasn't about someone being better, right? When you acknowledge those different places, you don't always necessarily think about one being better than the other. You think about the differentiator in them, and that's and what feed, is feeding your taste buds for that particular thing today. And that's also how, as a company, they are speaking to they are talking to their customers. That's what, the, that's what they're drilling into. They're not all, every commercial you see for a business is not, we're the best, we're the best, we're the greatest. Because you're kind of like, so you say, I don't, I've never had you, maybe not, maybe you are. But what they are feeding you is, if it's food, our steak looks better than any other steak that you've seen on this television. When you're talking about, um, uh, K Jewelers. I don't know why that just came to mind. Every kiss begins with K. It does. My jewelry doesn't have to come from K, but you're right. Every kiss does begin with K. So maybe I'll at least pay attention to you for a few more minutes. See what you got on, on the shelf. Um, but they are going to show you the highest quality that they can and entice you with that visual. But the words that come behind those things are the things that usually stick with you. It's the combination of the visual and the hour. And what you can do in your, your value to proposition is to be those auditory words that match that. But the reason I, I introduced the concept
myself as a visual is you don't always get the chance to speak to someone. So you have to be able to convey those benefits in multiple ways, in multiple translations. So let me ask you, does your customer have a job in this process?
we're kind of going to work. Value proposition works kind of like this. You're developing two things at the same time. So we're working from the right side. We're starting with the customer. Who's your customer? Now that you know your customer, what are the problems, what are the pains of your customer? And think of this in, in respect to your product or service, or service, your product or service. What are the pains? What is your customer looking to gain from your product? What, are, what can they gain? again of your customer. What are your pain relievers? When, we, when you think about this, the other part of my, my business is I have a, I, I sell a pair. It's really hard, I'm not going to lie to you, it's very difficult to tell somebody I'm relieving any type of pain other than being that kid. With a t shirt. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not one of those things I dig into a lot. Um, but it, this is a place where you have to begin to differentiate yourself from others. What does make your t shirt unique? My shirts, not this one. My shirts definitely say things people would love to say with their mouths and they can't. I don't know that you honestly, if you can't say it with your mouth, I'm not sure you really should wear my shirts. But, <laughs> But the reality is, they say things that you're thinking. You, you walk down the street, and maybe today you are not with the people. So you are, I'm sick of y'all. Um, and now people know, they're probably not gonna approach you because you're sick of them. They, you are sick, I'm sick of y'all. You know, um, I mistakenly last year wore a t-shirt and said, I hate it here, to, a, to, a, to our company um, lunch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, don't hate it here. Um, I really don't hate it here. I did hate the place I had to be before that lunch. I should have changed my shirt. 
But, you know, had on the matching face mask, you know? <laughs> I, I was doubling down in the previous meeting. I just want you all to know I was doubling down with some doubles in the previous meeting. But, when you think of these things, that's what you're thinking about, your customer. I know one of my customers' pains on the apparel side is they're probably a little facetious and they want to tell people a little bit more than they probably is appropriate all the time. Because the amount of people who tell me they want to wear a hated gear to work on Friday, on Capital Friday, is quite interesting. <laughs> My baby just quit. Um, but the flip side of that, I do have other shirts that are a little bit more, well, I was going to talk about the introverted shirt. That's not really inspirational. I'm going to walk away from that example. It's not inspirational. I don't have any inspirational shirts. Um, can't, can't go into that. But um, let me get back into where I was going. I, as you can see, I go off on tangents. That's why I keep walking back over here. I have to keep myself on track. <laughs> I, I'll go into a tangent quickly. So we talk on your side, pain relievers. The other thing I want you to think about as your, for your product in relation to your customer, game creators. What is something that can create a game based on your product for, you, for your customer? And that game can be anything from increased amount of time, decrease of but, um, from a budgetary standpoint, maybe a decrease of expenses, Maybe it's a decrease of their time commitment. What kind of game does your product create or service? I'm, we're going to just say product and service is the same thing in this because I'm going to keep leaving the product. <laughs> um, what type of game can you create? And the thing to think about with this, this side, this left side, this value side, we call this the value mapping side. And the thing to think about with the value mapping side is these, the answers to these questions are always in relation to your customer. It's not about you. Going back to where we started, it's not about you, it's not about how much you love it, it's not about what you create. It's about your customer and how it solves their problems, their pains, and what they need. That's the number one thing that we always have to think about in this, is staying in, staying in tune with that. Now, crafting that value proposition. You have to understand, you, you now have, have mapped out for your customer both sides of the field, right? You've mapped out what their pains are, what they would like to gain, what they need to gain by your solution. You've mapped out who you are, what you provide, how you can relieve their pain, how you can help them gain. Now is, now is the time to, in terms of creating that value proposition to understand how you translate one the other. So what, the way you do that is that you address all of those positions in one statement. One statement. So, I want to put another slide up on the screen. This is a little, little text, well, I won't say a little text, a little ad lib that we, we like to use. You trying to do the wires?
charge you with the blanks, then we'll come back, hopefully this will work. And then you put it up there. So the, what we're going to be, the, the template is R, insert your product or service, helps, insert your customer segment, who want to acknowledge that job that they need to do, by any verb um, that is lessened from a pain. So we're going into that, we're starting with the pain. And this can be shifted around. Hopefully I'll be able to show you that. Um, <laughs> this could just be shifted around. So we'll say reduce said pain and increase said gain. Insert customer segment who want to insert one of the jobs that needs to be done by your customer. By, we'll say reducing a verb. Reducing and acknowledge their pain, your customer pain. And verb, we'll say increasing a customer gain.
And that's where your focus has to be from a, on a consistent basis, is, is digging in and understanding what is the problem that you're actually solving. Because again, I jokingly say, when it comes to selling apparel, I'm, I'm, the problem is you can't go outside naked. Like, <laughs> like you, you can't go outside without a shirt on, or at least you shouldn't, because uh, I don't know, 2021, a lot of things happen. Um, but you shouldn't go outside without a shirt on. Like, that's the problem. But the reality is, it's not really you solving the problem. Now you have to transition to when you start thinking about the pain, right? What's the pain? The pain is, some days, my clients want to walk out the house and they want you to know exactly how they feel. They're introverts and they want you to know they extroverted yesterday. Today is not your day. <laughs> Today is not your day. They want you to know they're sick of y'all ish. They want y'all to know, like, those are things that my clients want. That's why they put those shirts on. The same is true for everybody else with the apparel club. Whatever your shirt, that shirt says, that person bought it because today they want you to know that's how they feel. Right? So if we, or that's what they support. Key, what kind of shirt do you like? Lord, it says entrepreneurs need to be funny. Again, that's what you want people to know. That's why you put it on in the middle of the start. You, yes. want, you want people who are seeing you to acknowledge this about you without you ever having to say anything. It fills that need. That's the pain. It's really speaking, the pain that will go with just graphic tees in general, the pain that a graphic tee fulfills, it's not really a pain. We can all be honest about that. The pain, per se, is the acknowledgement that I want you to know something without me talking. I want to send you a subliminal message. Maybe I want to be a little passive aggressive in some cases. That's what that does. So understanding that is important. When you try to go past that, and, or you try to act like there's a real problem that you're solving with a teacher, that's when you lose. Like, that's when you lose everybody. Because it becomes, uh, are we really doing anything? Like, I mean, I got a lot of shirts. So I mean, I, I'm not ever going to go out naked. I might go out um, undesirable. Um, there, there's going to be some of that. I might be that's a little undesirable. But I'm probably not, I don't really have a necessity to go out naked. We're not quite there yet, right? So it's an acknowledgement of that. The other thing to think about when you're talking about pain. So you said you've been in the restaurant industry for 20 years and now you're going out on your own consulting. What is your ideal client? Or who, I should say who? Not consulting So let's pull back on that a little bit. So what is the pain? Um, lack of convenience. I mean, there's not a convenient place downtown. There's a very expensive place downtown. And downtown is filling up with so many residents. Mm -hmm. It's no longer, downtown is no longer a work destination. It is also home to just so many people. Um, and just having that, that location, that convenient location to go to. So when you, for one of your customer pains is going to be is going to be that convenience portion. What and then their their but their gain is also convenience. So let's pull out another pain. Cause you're solving the convenience problem, right? That's the pro that's that's what you're gaining. They're actually gaining the convenience of location. Yeah. So it's the, but that's the that's that's the pain. That's when we talk about those pain relievers. So what's another pain that could be? Is it is it good? Is it quality wine? It is quality wine. It's not gonna be wine that you can find in your local like grocery store. So there's an accessibility piece that comes in with that. Yeah. Um, there's an exploration piece that comes in with that. Yeah. Um, exposure yeah. that all comes with that. So it's pulling those pieces out. Because to simply say wine, then I can think, well, I can go get wine over at Jollity. I can have wine when I go over to Solar. Because there's places that sell wine. In, in downtown. I, and, and I'm only saying this to get you to dig deeper. Sure. Because you're supplying a different experience. Correct. Right? It's an off premise. So it's not, it's wine that you would take with you mm -hmm. to drink in the comfort of your own home from, you know, a smaller family owned winery in Alexander Valley of California that you can't get through a distributor or any other retail location in the same area. So those are things you have to pull out because you have to differentiate yourself with just the wine piece, right? Because also you also said wine tasting, correct? Correct. So you 
you have to pull yourself a little bit out of this, the wine heap, and you have to dig into those other other pieces mm -hmm. that they can't experience somewhere else. Right. Because technically, I don't know if this is this still true, Kim. Can you still buy, purchase alcohol to go mm -hmm. around? So yeah. So now with that shift, before 2020, we couldn't do that. But there is a significant shift that comes along with that. So you're playing against that a little bit. But you are supplying something that we lost two, three years ago when all of the wine lost and galleries left. So you're fulfilling a different need. So it's acknowledging that part and the experience that happens in there and giving the customer that. Um, and what void, and acknowledging the void that you're filling for them in that. Because maybe I don't want to have to go to a restaurant to experience a wine thing. Right, and pay a restaurant price for wine. Exactly. Maybe I do just want to come in with a by myself or with a couple friends, mm -hmm. taste a couple wines, and then let's go home and finish our, our movie night. Exactly. So it's appealing to that. So it's pulling out all of those pieces. Okay. But you see how we talk through that and we get to kind of the nuts and bolts yeah. of, okay, so I'm doing this, but it's like, let's find what the real pain is. But also, more importantly for you, the pain, I think, is relatively obvious. The gain is where you're going to have to really dig to translate that gain significantly mm -hmm. so that they do feel like it's a different experience than what I'm going to get if I just pop into a restaurant and sit at a bar. Okay. You know? Yeah. Um, yes, ma'am. Did you write your summary? Well, I was saying that uh, <laughs> uh, you're, you're talking convenience. It was like, well, it, you know, a pain could be not having to drive as far and find parking. You can walk. Mm -hmm. Walking distance for residents, potentially, depending. Down, trust me, um, I live downtown. Downtown is bigger than it looks. Um, <laughs> when you put it out on it, bigger than it looks when you're in the car. Um, so just be mindful of that. Just be mindful of that. Tell me your name. I know you're doing financial. Yeah, Charles. Charles. So tell me, what is one of your customer pains? So one of our customer pains is they have very limited time. They're already pulled very tightly. You know, they, they have a lot of different things to juggle. And so we help to take care of things like their financing their books, their financial strategy, things like that, without them having to go out and completely hire someone on their staff. So we do like fractional CFO okay. um, work and things like that, so that you can have the benefits of having like a financial team and an HR team, but not have to pay full salary value for that, especially when you're just starting out and can't necessarily afford to pay someone, you know, 60000 100000 things like that. Okay, so I'm hearing a couple things. Um, and anybody else chime in if you hear any, any of the pain. So one of the pains I'm hearing is time. Mm -hmm. Another pain that I'm hearing is expense. Yeah. Right? So, and those are also two of the gains I'm hearing. The availability mm -hmm. uh, of time. Um, and pretend, the, the thing about the expense, it depends on where the business is in their business. Yeah. On whether it's a benefit or if it's still kind of a pain in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Because in the very beginning, as a company is growing, it's one of, the, and Katie is actually talking about this next, um, but about the, the financial pieces. Um, but that strain of actually paying good attention, and Teresa left, but Teresa can tell you as well, um, the pain and strain that comes with building a business early on and actually paying good attention to the financial piece. It's usually one of the top pieces that is ignored. And it's also, uh, for some reason, numbers, Numbers can be intimidating. Finances can be intimidating. It's a lot to comb through. And I think it's also, we, we fear the IRS so much, right? <laughs> like, if we're being honest, we fear the IRS so much. So a lot of us are like, I don't want to touch it. I'm just going to get this to somebody during tax season because I don't want to mess it up, right? So we don't touch it at all. We don't touch, we don't touch the simple things. Like, you know that was revenue. You got paid that day. Just mark that as revenue. You know, somebody at a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> but, um, we, we fear it, so it's not touched. Mm -hmm. So in the very beginning, and often it is, you know it's something you need, businesses know it's something they need to do, but they also don't even ask a company like yours yeah. because of the fear of it being such a gross expense on them that they mm -hmm. can't handle. So it literally will just allow a person to go through an entire year and then probably pay triple mm -hmm. to now have you come through um, a year worth of things. So with that, about what do you see yourself falling from a value proposition standpoint? Now, we're, after we've been looking at this and discussing it, 
what do you feel like you have to pinpoint for your ideal customer? So I, I think for our ideal customer, um, we, we want to be able to um, increase clarity. So having them understand their finances and understand what the next few years look like for them, um, especially from a cash perspective, what they can spend, you know, where they can allocate certain amounts of their money. So I think clarity, increasing clarity is a big thing. Increasing time, like you said, so giving you back time to focus more on, say, the strategy side of things so that you don't have to worry about balancing the books or things like that. You can focus on you know, marketing or strategy or whatever else you really want to be focused on and not the things that have kind of been bogging you down. So from like a time perspective, increasing time. Um, and then I also think decreasing stress, decreasing um, kind of uh, like, and also increasing financial stability. So I think, I think those are some of the different you know, gains they absolutely are. And one of the things you have to address when you're having, if you get one sentence, mm -hmm. you have to address fear. Yeah. That's where I'm trying to get you. You have to address fear. You have to address fear because you're talking to people that fear potentially several things. And all of those things, you're absolutely right. You, you've talked about several pay, a couple pay relievers and game creators. Mm -hmm. But the piece for a lot of the people who you're trying to attract is you've got to address the fear. Yeah. You've got to address the fear of, I can't afford this. You've got to address the fear of, did I mess this up? Am I gonna mess this up? You have to address the fear of, not even, <clears throat> and where am I going next? Because you talked about the fact that you create financial statements to help people understand the outlook. Mm -hmm. um, that's, as much as it sounds positive when you say it, that's a fearful place. Mm -hmm. Because what if you come back and say that you're not gonna be here and if I'm scared and I don't think I'm doing anything right, that's what I think you're gonna tell me. Mm -hmm. I think you're gonna walk over here and tell me, well, listen, it's been nice. Um, we've had a good year together. Um, but really and truly, this is also your last year. Mm -hmm. um, and you laugh, but a lot of people, that's how they feel because there's a, and I hate this phrase. Um, there, <laughs> there's this phrase of, I don't know what I don't know. And I absolutely hate the phrase but there's a lot of truth in the phrase. You don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, unfortunately, we compare ourselves a lot, which I I told y'all to look at y'all competitors and I'm gonna do a little double talk, but that's business. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna do a little double. Um, but you can research your competitors without comparing yourself to your competitors. Mm -hmm. But we do a lot of comparison. So a lot of times, especially in the world we live in, we're visually seeing other people who appear to be further than us, right? Like they appear to be ahead of us, making more money than us, and a lot of times those people are broke. Um, but they appear to be all these things, right? So we're, we're running in these races with people, and we and so when we see you, we think we're not doing well. Mm -hmm. Because we've never, we have no idea what a balance sheet is, to know, we have no idea what a PNL is, we've never seen one of those before. Mm -hmm. So you have to address that fear. Yeah. You have to bring a person in to let them know, even it, and it may not be okay. The reality is you may not pick up somebody who may not be okay to mm -hmm. But you also have to reassure them that them working with you is what's going to turn them yeah, that around. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else want to work through it? We got, ooh, uh, got to run outside again. Um, they have me on stage today. Um, anybody else want to work through this? Yes, ma'am. Tell me more about that. Is it, um, there, are there sayings mm -hmm. or are they, you said they're sayings? Okay. Um, so to some extent, you're following similar to me. You, you are saying something that people want to say without speaking, correct? Right. Um, so you have that part in place. What else? What else could be a pain for your particular or, you know what, let's back up from there. Who is your customer? Because uh, I can tell you I'm not, I'm not your customer. I don't worry you being <laughs> uh, Some of my shirts have uh, scriptures on them, so I would say Christian. And then some of them don't. So, like, I want to reach all people. Mm -hmm. When you talk to everybody, 
I'm talking about one year years old, and they were all. Who wants to wear an inspirational message? Who wants to, because the person who wants to wear an inspirational message 
the person who wants to wear a scripture are also two different people. Because the person who will put a scripture on their body may not be the person who wants to say, do great today. Because both of those can be considered inspiration. The person who wears a shirt that says, you're amazing, may not want to be anywhere near a scripture because of everything else they're doing in life. I don't know. I don't put a lot of scripture on my body. Because <laughs> I cuss and I do a lot of things. I drink. Uh, so I don't put scripture on. Like I can't end up at the bar and I got a scripture t-shirt on. Like I'm gonna feel a little weird. Like I'm just, just gonna be like, Ugh, get me out of here. Um, so I don't. But that's just me. Now I also have a Bible app on my phone. So you know, it, it, you know, look at that one today. Like I'm a little bit of an oxymoron. But I say that to say is you, that's why you have to start high and come down low. Of maybe those scripture shirts have a totally different market than the actual shirts that are just inspirational and say, you are amazing, I'm amazing, have a great day. I, I, I have no idea what you're saying, for, honestly. But <laughs> those, those things, that, that, that emotion is very different than God so loved the world. That's why I'm confused because I have a shirt that would reach a person that would wear a shirt with a scripture on it, and then I have shirts that don't have a scripture on it. So that's why I said, it's too different. Different. Yeah, it's too different. Different. And that's why you have to, but you still have to pull away from all. Because you can have multiple markets. Every product you have is not necessarily going to be sold to the same person. Like I said, I have an introvert shirt. That person may not want to wear, an introvert, just because they're introverted doesn't mean they want to wear a shirt with a cuss word. Or a cuss word insinuation. Right? So you have to really define those things. Because you may have two totally different segments. But that's why, but but again, going to the all, you've now given yourself way too broad of a group to talk to. And you still may never hit the actual person you're attending. While if you say, this person is who I want to talk to, and this person who I should be talking to about these scripture shirts, that's every time you create a piece of marketing, it's going to hit them. Also to acknowledge, your target market doesn't mean someone outside of your target market can't hurt you. It simply means you're not cre you didn't create the product for them, which is okay, and you did not create the marketing for them, which is still okay. I own Jordans. Jordans were made for young black men who play basketball. Games. If you know anybody who's not a young black man who plays basketball that owns a pair of Jordans, they are clearly wearing Ferguson. And all of my thirty plus year old friends clearly are not playing basketball uh, effectively right now. Okay, so <laughs> so everyone who owns that. So it's not about, you're not excluding someone by being intentional about talking to someone. And, you, and that's the place where we, we miss, because a lot of times people hear, but anybody can buy it, yeah, anybody can. It doesn't mean you talk to anybody. If a little girl right now was sitting over there in that corner of Sell Lip Gloss and you decided to patronize her, she should in no way change all of her marketing away from her age group to now feed adults. Because an adult already bought it, but what she was already doing. So obviously you were okay with how she marketed herself. I think you're smiling. I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. I see your eyes moving. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to read your face. 